and welcome to Media 7. I'm Russell Brown. In this week's show, we look at an interesting couple of weeks for New Zealand's ethnic Indian community and quiz financial journalist Bernard Hickey about his act of economic apostasy. But first, we're off to the movies, or not. The Good Burgers of Grey Lynn are used to seeing cameras on the corner and shorty stars doing the shopping, but even by local standards, this Tuesday night was quite the throng of thespians. Turns out they were Mordor as hell, they'd gone sour on the film industry, and they weren't shy about Tolkien about it. We just want a fair deal. That's all we want. But, said the sign on the door, you shall not pass. One well, news Simon Bradwell summed it up quite well. A group of American, British and Australasian unions calling on actors to boycott the film until such time as the producer has entered into a collective bargaining agreement. But struck what would turn out to be a fairly common problem. The Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, the Australian union issuing the challenge, wouldn't return calls. Two of the most famous faces in the acting fraternity made themselves available to Campbell Live, where the host asked them what they wanted. What do you want? Tell them what you want. A fair go, apparently, although they did know what it wasn't about. It is not about money. money. And while faces from either side of the dispute contributed their five cents, does that cover residuals, there was remarkably little said about the American Screen Actors Guild provision behind all this. The one rule to ring them all. Global Rule One. To be continued. And I'm sure there will be much more of that. Now, the news around the 2010 Commonwealth Games in Delhi hasn't been much about sport, and some of it hasn't been very sporting at all. Jose Barbosa explains. I'm Mike McRoberts in Delhi. Let the games begin. A spectacular opening ceremony gets the games underway. Also spectacular must have been the relief from the organisers, because judging by the news coverage in the weeks previous, you could have been forgiven for expecting the whole country to suddenly go flying off into space. As the countdown to the games started, so too did questions about security. Gunmen on a motorbike opened fire on the vehicle, wounding two Taiwanese tourists. I honestly believe, hand on heart as a fellow Kiwi, you will have a safe and secure environment in which to practice these games. Yeah, well, stick it up your hooper, Mike, cos look at this. An Australian news reporter demonstrated how it was possible to buy the ingredients for a bomb on the black market and take them into the main games venue. Damning stuff. Except it was stuff that didn't stack up, like stuff. We believe it's a shocking beat-up. This sting operation is totally bogus and incorrect. That place is far off from the main entry gate of Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium, from where the actual manual checking of pedestrians is done. And I believe this makes the entire stunt ridiculous and dishonest. And the same applies to Duffy's acting, or whatever you'd call this. We even get a demonstration. Jeez. And if implied violence wasn't enough, it was reported that the athletes' accommodation was all a bit first-year uni flat. Tonight on 3 News, the Delhi Games boss who says someone's expecting way too much from his toilets. Reports suggest it's disgustingly unhygienic. Human faeces have been found in some of the buildings. The story was one that just kept on giving, even if you weren't anywhere near India. Hillary, the list of problems just grows and grows by the day. Meanwhile, those in charge of our athletes were flying back and forth, trying to decide if New Zealand should be there at all. By the time their decision was due to be announced, the anticipation was almost too much to handle. We will have that media conference live the moment the bosses arrive. We're live on you now. Are you live now? We're live now. Our activity is live now. We're, on, we're live now, sir. We can go. But in the end, we were going after all. It's hard to shake the feeling that most Westerners haven't evolved beyond seeing India as backward, dirty and overpopulated. Jesus. What the hell is going on? But these issues are ones that our broadcasters are duty-bound to report, so perhaps there's no harm done. Well, almost. What's her name? Dick Shit. <laughs> is it Dick Shit? Dick Oh. Dick sit. Oh, dick sit. Dick sit. It just looks different to what you say. Well, it looks like dick shit. I know it does, Paul, but it's not that. It's there's, dick there's, sit. There she is, there. Sheila dick shit. Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and it's so appropriate because she's Indian. 
We'll get on to that in the moment. Uh, to discuss the games and the bomb dropped into the ethnic conversation this week, I'm joined by Venkat Raman, the editor of Indian Newslink, and Dev Nadkami, editor of Indian Weekender. Welcome to you both, gentlemen. Uh, you just saw the end of uh, uh, that item with, with Paul Henry. Was that funny? If you can call that funny, it could be uh, quite obnoxious, I would say, and uh, unwarranted and called for. And there are various ways of pronouncing names, but I suppose a commentator or broadcaster must know how a name has to be pronounced. I suppose one should take pains to understand the sensitivities involved and how a name must be pronounced. This is absolute rubbish. Yeah, you, even if you were to pass that off as a joke, uh, you know, his last statement, the rounding off statement, because she's Indian, that sh showed the whole thing uh, as, you know, what he really had in mind. And that was to really demean uh, uh, Indians. I mean, that's the way you look at it. So um, I don't think it was funny. And I don't think anyone, uh, you know, any uh, ethnic Indian watcher uh, of that program would think so. And unfortunately, this was not the only instance because there's been a build up. I mean, we've seen the unfortunate circumstances through which the uh, build up to the games has been through. And at every stage, I think uh, Mr. Henry made it a point to run down some aspect of it. And he fell right into that stereotypical trap about uh, India being backward. And, uh, well, you've you got to look beyond the stereotype. I mean, the country is capable of sending an uh, unmanned vehicle to the moon. It can uh, uh, organize IPL, another sports event, which is completely organized professionally. I mean, there are reasons why these things don't happen, and those are the reasons which I think media, responsible well, media should I go think into. It, I think it was your paper that quoted uh, community leader Paul Singh, who said he thought that Paul Henry had been, quote, on a trip belittling India and Indians since the run-up to the Commonwealth Games. Do you that's think right. that's what was happening? I think so, yes, yes, because yeah. he was talking about, uh, you know, we had uh, news about uh, parts of the roof of a stadium falling off and well those kind of things are bound to happen in what is known as the third world which a term which I don't agree with but then uh, to be a little that in a national program and apart from that like, I like think going to in... great lengths to be little deliberately is yeah. is absolutely uh, you know uh, it, it is unforgivable and to take names out and pronounce them deliberately is not on. And what is more appalling is for some people to say, within the mainstream media, I'm afraid, that one has to be humorous, one has to understand humor, and there's what's called freedom of speech in this country. Freedom of speech is never forgotten. It is a given thing in New Zealand, as it is and in many other countries. And it's very much the case in India. You have a very lively free press there, yes. don't you? If someone in India were to take some of the other European names which are funny sounding and then pronounce the syllables wrongly, it's not on. We would not accept that either. And the, the last uh, thing that he said, as they pointed out a moment ago, oh, she's Indian. It's absolute trash. I mean, this hasn't been highlighted in the, in the past few days. And um, I would say that it's just not funny. And, of course, the, the big one has been the comments about the Governor-General. What, what's the response been from your reader communities? As far as uh, we're concerned is that we've, re we've been receiving something like 50 to 60 emails and equal number of phone calls asking us to condemn outright the, the kind of comments that Paul Henry made, um, which completely negates his capability as a broadcaster. And whatever good points that he might have earned in the past few years have been negated in that one minute of the statement that he made. The feeling that we have got from the community is that it's just not against a particular community, it's against everyone whose color of the skin is not white. Some media savvy uh, Indians, I mean, they don't work in the media, but uh, the, the, this, the, their response shows how media savvy some people can be. They said that, yeah, we understand. Unfortunately, this is the fallout of this conversation which Mr. John Key, Prime Minister, has had to face. And what these people have said in emails to us, to our website, is that we understand Paul Henry doing this because that's his job. He has to needle people. He has to get responses. That's his... Well, you're both journalists. That, that's the way he does it. But for the Prime Minister to appear to play along and not say anything until later in the day, uh, you know, reflects very poorly uh, on him both as a politician or, you know, with the questions his political new uh, 
a politician mm. should think on his feet. You know, he's been defended as saying that uh, he had a long flight and he had he was jet lagged and he was he was caught off the wrong uh, caught, caught off the back foot or something like that. But a politician has to think on his toes, and unless uh, he uh, and the National Party does mm. something to assuage the feelings of of the ethnic community, especially the Indian community, I think you know uh, sooner he does. Now, um, uh, I've uh, got uh, to say one more thing. Okay, one one more email thing, was very succinct, succinctly <laughs> put. One reader said, you enjoy looking at a rainbow rather than just a white colour. I think that's well said. Hmm. Now, um, I have to say, in any other week, uh, this would have been the big story on your turf, but uh, there is, of course, the electoral fraud story in South sure. Auckland. Um, we need to be careful not to breach name suppression there, but it's a matter of record that many right. of the names uh, involved were Indian. I also get the impression that uh, many uh, of the Indian community out in South Auckland are furious about this. Would that be accurate? Ind indeed. Um, none of us in the right mind would like to condone any electoral flaw fraud. This cannot happen. It should not happen. And we would certainly, whenever we are allowed to, we would bring an analysis of the whole thing. And I think it's very important for everyone to understand the electoral process in New Zealand, which is about graft, which is about board, it's fair and democratic. Everyone has to play by the rules, irrespective of that person's ethnicity. And if these things happen somewhere else in some parts of the world, there's no business for that to happen in uh, New Zealand. This is our take on the subject, and we do not condone it. And we are quite furious, and we would carry the opinions of the community all of them are furious about it, and there's an element of shame as well. I'm sure they will agree to that. Yeah, I agree that uh, you know there's an element of shame. People don't want to be attacked by the same brush, which is a natural human tendency for people to do. You know, they probably mm. paint every Indian in the same way. But if you look a little deeper, the whole thing is so ham-handed that they may well have got the Commonwealth Games planners as consultants. Who planned, who planned that whole scare? <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I, I have to say but, 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 uh, that your paper has often gone quite hard on corruption stories. It's, it, yes. it's, it, it's, a, you know, it's a serious area for you. Um, I thought we might want to finish on uh, an upbeat note. Um, Diwali coming up at the end of the month. Indeed. Um, th this is becoming a more and more important and, and more mainstream uh, festival, isn't it? It, it, it? Has it become the festival of Indian identity in, in New Zealand? Yes, it all started when Asia and New Zealand Foundation, at that point of time known as Asia 2000, about seven or eight years ago, when they approached us and they wanted to have, have uh, uh, a proper festivity, if you like, because it's known as the Festival of Lights. And we saw that growing and we knew that this would attract more and more people because Diwali is about hope, revival, renaissance, goodness, goodwill, etc., etc. And I'm so happy that over the last seven or eight years, this festival has begun to attract more and more people. And where would you get 100 or 150,000 people gathered together enjoying the food, the colour, the costumes, the dances, etc.? I think it's a great thing. And it's spreading to other parts of New Zealand. And the season has already started, although for those who might want to know, the actual date of the festival is 5th of November. But that's the day when people individually would go out and greet friends and family. So most of the festivals conducted by organizations are much before. And it's, it's a great thing. So yeah. add to that, uh, I was in Rotorua uh, last week, and where they had the third successive uh, Diwali festival. And this time the, the theme was a Maori Diwali. So we had amazing fusion dances of uh, Maori Haka and Bharat Natyam. And uh, which was amazingly beautifully choreographed by both Maori and Indian artists, and you know that, that's that's the kind of platform you see uh, a sea of faces, a sea of ethnicities, and you ask, you know, who is a New Zealander? All of them look like. New On that note, I think we have to go. Um, thank you very much, Venkat Raman and Dev Nadkami. After the break, thinking the unthinkable about money and government.